I want to take you back to December of 1974, nearly 50 years ago, right before Christmas. Legendary reporter Seymour Hirsch manages to break the story of U.S. intelligence agencies spying on ordinary people in the U.S. Americans spying on Americans. It's a bombshell report. And within weeks, Senator Frank Church, a Democrat from Idaho, has gotten the go-ahead from his colleagues to set up a committee to investigate those allegations. It would become known as the Church Committee, and it would be remembered as the gold standard for congressional investigations, uncovering staggering levels of corruption and misconduct in America's intelligence agencies, especially inside the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover, the figurehead, if you will, of abuses of power by a U.S. police or intelligence agency. You'll recall that Hoover's tyranny included the FBI's electronic surveillance of Martin Luther King and of John F. Kennedy. Hoover's FBI also targeted and or tried to infiltrate Vietnam War protesters, feminist groups, and environmentalist groups. Nobody in the U.S. was off limits, not even the president himself. And that was just the work of the FBI, just one bureau, one agency. There was also the CIA, the NSA, and the IRS. Bean counters turned spooks. Just listen to the warning that Chairman Frank Church gave on Meet the Press in August of 1975, as his committee was still conducting its investigation. No American would have any privacy left, such as the capability to monitor everything, telephone conversations, telegrams, it doesn't matter. There would be no place to hide. If this government ever became a tyranny. That clip may have been from almost 50 years ago, but telegrams aside, it sounds awfully familiar, awfully prescient, does it not? It took the Church Committee 14 different reports to document all of their findings, and their work had a huge impact. As Time magazine puts it, in the wake of the Church Committee, the House and Senate each established their own permanent select committees on intelligence to provide oversight of the intelligence community. And Congress passed what we know as FISA, which required intelligence agencies to seek approval from a special court before beginning surveillance of American citizens. So why am I reminding you of all this? because House Republicans want you to believe that one of its new congressional panels is the second coming. Yes, the second coming of the Church Committee. A new Judiciary Subcommittee will begin investigating the FBI, the Justice Department, you know, the people who just so happen to be investigating Donald Trump. The subcommittee will also look into the quote-unquote deep state, and as expected, it will be led by combative conservative Jim Jordan, yes. Him, Jim Jordan, him again. Because if you're planning to conduct a shady investigation where cutting off witnesses and what about is them are the main strategies, then shouty McShirt Sleeves is your guy. Have a listen. So this is what we're focused on, this, this pervasive kind of uh, weaponizing government against your political opponents. It goes yes. all the way to the president who stood in front of Independence Hall and said what he did, called half the country fascist. And of course, it's driven by now the dozens and dozens of of uh, FBI agents who have come to us as whistleblowers and told us about what's going on. Got it. Got it. So Jordan's Revenge Committee is going to be investigating, among other things, how the free speech of conservatives has been assaulted, allegedly, over the past two years. But their feelings were hurt when Joe Biden gave a speech in Philadelphia calling out their fascist beliefs. I guess to Jim Jordan, the First Amendment, like so much of the Constitution, only applies selectively. And newsflash, Jim Jordan is not Frank Church, who acted with near full support. Only two senators voted against the formation of 1975's Church Committee. The vote was 84 to 2. Meanwhile, the vote to approve Jordan's subcommittee, that is definitely not a new Church Committee, was 221 to 211, along strict party lines. Republicans on the Church Committee were famous moderates, like Howard Baker. Monday House Republicans angling to work with Jordan are noted wingnuts and rebels like Thomas Massey and Dan Bishop. A reminder, this is how Congressman Massey and his family celebrate the birth of Christ. Sometimes a picture really is worth a thousand words. But wait, there's more. The official title of Church's committee was the Senate Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities. And Jordan's dog and pony show? Well, the title is the House Select Committee, sorry, the House Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. It's yet another example of today's Republicans just saying the quiet part out loud. 
As former federal prosecutor and MSNBC analyst Bob McQuaid tells Time magazine, quote, if you've already called it weaponization, you've reached a conclusion before you've undertaken any investigation. Exactly. The whole thing is rigged from the outset. You have a better chance of winning an iPhone out of a claw machine than you do getting a fair investigation out of Jim Jordan's Judiciary Subcommittee. His undertaking has absolutely nothing to do with reforming the FBI and everything to do with making Biden look bad while making Trump look good. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of Frank Church's top committee aide. Locke Johnson writes in New Lines magazine, quote, Unfortunately, Republicans appear to be invoking Church's legacy not to push for real solutions, as the late senator did, but to obtain impunity for themselves and punish their enemies. In the process, they're misrepresenting the committee's storied history. It's time to correct the record. Yes, it is. And to be clear, this Jordan subcommittee is a partisan, shameless group of people that doesn't remotely resemble the committee chaired by Senator Frank Church during the 1970s. Not even close. If you want to make a historical analogy, Jim Jordan is more Joe McCarthy than Frank Church. You remember the House Un-American Activities Committee chaired by Senator Joe Mark McCarthy during the 1950s, right? You know, the anti-communist Red Scare during the height of the Cold War, duck and cover, kids, duck and cover, where Senator McCarthy, among other things, falsely accused the State Department of harboring communists and held hearings to investigate the alleged influence of the Communist Party on the content of Hollywood films. Only this time in present-day America, the indoctrination, the mind trick, the greatest game the Republican Party ever played is that Donald Trump is allowed to misuse federal agencies and federal resources to benefit himself. Trump is allowed to push the Department of Justice to endorse his false claims of election fraud. Trump is allowed to consider ordering the military to seize voting machines. No questions asked, not from the Republican Party. Investigating any of that, investigating Trump's actual weaponization of the federal government, is instead itself now going to be probed by his lackeys as weaponizing the government. So, a new church committee? Please stop with that. They may want to pretend that's what it is, but the rest of us don't have to buy into that BS. I mean, Frank Church must be turning in his grave. Now, who better to talk to about all this than the aide to Chairman Frank Church and his committee, former aide Locke Johnson, author of that piece I mentioned, The Show Trial of the Century for Newslines magazine. Also here is Barbara McQuaid, who I also quoted, former U.S. attorney and MSNBC legal analyst. Thank you both for joining me today. Locke, let me start with you. Jim Jordan and others say that this is the new church committee. You say it's not. Is it fair, as I just said, to say it's more Joe McCarthy than Frank Church, to borrow from the late Lloyd Benson, you knew Frank Church, you worked with Frank Church. Is Jim Jordan Frank Church? Uh, not quite, no. In fact, it's uh, comparing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in some ways. I would uh, say that the most important question here is, what does a good congressional investigation look like? And I think it really has three ingredients. First of all, I think it needs to be bipartisan. And as you have so eloquently pointed out, the church committee was highly bipartisan. After all, you had Barry Goldwater, a Mr. Conservative himself, working closely with Frank Church. And then you had John Tower, equally conservative. And you had uh, three other Republicans on that committee, along with six Democrats. And at the end of the day, uh, a majority of the Republicans joined all the Democrats in approving the report. And, and later on, the Senate, by an overwhelming majority, accepted the report and created new intelligence oversight. So first of all, you've got bipartisanship on the Church Committee, uh, and you hardly have that on the envisioned Jordan subcommittee. I think you also have to look at leadership. Frank Church, when he was 20 years old, was an intelligence officer in World War II in the Indian theater of war. And then he went on to law school at one of the top law schools, law schools in the country. He was elected to the U.S. Senate uh, as the fourth youngest person ever elected to that body. And then he served on the Foreign Relations Committee for over two decades. So you had Church, you had, as I mentioned, Goldwater, who you'll recall was the Republican yeah. nominee for president in 1964, John Tower, very experienced, Howard Baker. So you had able leadership on that uh, panel. And then finally, I would mention that methodology is important. How should an inquiry be carried out? And I think the church committee decided the only way to carry out a good inquiry is to be fact-oriented. So we very carefully followed the 
documentary trail and we, we carefully listened to witnesses. We yeah. were respectful to them and polite. None of them rejected our subpoena requests. So those three ingredients are important, and I simply don't see them in the Jordan Committee. The Jordan well, Committee is partisan. Yeah. The, the leadership is, uh, is not that experienced. And finally, they're not using a fact-oriented approach. Um, they're not using a fact-oriented approach at all. And Bob, uh, you speak so eloquently on the weaponization that's in the subcommittee's title to Time magazine. I want to quote you again from that piece. You say, it's confirmation bias at its worst when you begin with an idea of where the investigation is going to lead. So let me ask you that, where exactly do you think this examination will lead? Where will it end up? We pretty much know what the top lines of any report that Jordan produces will say, do we not? Do you think the word weaponization is going to be in their final conclusion, Mitty? <laughs> uh, I do. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, kind of a lesson one to investigators. Don't have a conclusion before you start your investigation. Uh, as Locke just said, it's the facts that matter. Now, if you have concerns about abuses in government, uh, you say we're going to investigate, you know, how... Uh, the FBI and other agencies have been utilizing their uh, investigative powers. Uh, and you, maybe they've heard from witnesses. Jim Jordan suggests he's heard from FBI agents he refers to as whistleblowers. Let's hear what they have to say before we reach a conclusion. You know, if you look at the select committee on the January 6th uh, in investigation, you know, they didn't call that a, a, an investigation into a weaponization, uh, into an insurrection. Uh, we knew there was a physical attack. And it was simply an investigation into that attack. It did not impute any conclusions in that title or in that mission. Uh, we have just the opposite here. And so it, it seems that, you know, this is uh, a classic case of not only confirmation bias, but disinformation by putting out there in the, the, the ecosphere this idea that, uh, that investigations have been weaponized simply by giving it this name. Yeah. And so members of the public who are too busy to pay close attention hear about weaponization and they draw the conclusion that, oh, I guess investigations have been weaponized. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a handy propagandistic uh, trick. Uh, Locke, you write in your Newsline piece that you have, quote, no illusions about the FBI. You say it has done valuable work and committed terrible abuses. You mentioned Ruby Ridge, uh, but there are plenty of others. How do we distinguish, I mean, we should distinguish, should we not, Locke, between good faith actors who want to genuinely investigate the FBI, reform the FBI, see what the FBI is getting wrong, and Republicans who suddenly started hating the FBI as soon as the FBI went after Trump? Yes, indeed. And, you know, if you were objective about this, if, if one were going to have an objective inquiry, then there's a lot of important uh, information here and, and some topics that really need close looking at. Uh, for example, how did those documents get to Mar-a-Lago? How did they get to Biden's house? How did they get to Pence's house? Uh, and what is the damage been? That's a legitimate question. And then um, the, the whole idea of whether or not the FBI overreacted in, in going into Mar-a-Lago. Uh, as opposed to apparently going in more slowly to the Biden house. So these are questions that we should answer, but uh, you've got to have some civility. What happened to manners in the United States of America? <laughs> what happened to politeness and treating each other as human beings? If you've got nothing but shrill yelling across the partisan line, you're not going to be able to have rational answers to yeah. any of these questions. Bob, as a former federal prosecutor, you obviously worked with the FBI. Let me put the same question to you. They do a lot of good work, the FBI, but they've done a lot of bad things, too. As a Muslim, I can think about how many stories I've covered of entrapment, surveillance, etc. Um, the FBI is worthy of investigation, is it not, Bob, if not by Jim Jordan's partisan subcommittee? A absolutely. And I think they would be the first to say that uh, they should be held to a high standard. They should be held accountable if there is any abuse of their very significant powers. Uh, and they should be an open book to people who want to look at them. As you say, there is this history, the things that the Church Committee uh, uncovered, their co-intel pro program, profiling, and other kinds of things. And as a result of that work, the system got better, and guidelines were produced, and a domestic investigations operations guide was produced. Um, so government gets better when there is scrutiny and accountability, but it has to be done in a spirit of fairness, openness, and truth, and not simply a conclusion in search of a series of facts. Uh, you know, this reminds me of the Judi Senate Judiciary Committee hearing that we had maybe a year or so ago when Merrick Garland 
had uh, asked U.S. attorneys in the field to uh, help support local law enforcement in the investigations of threats and harassment against local school boards and health officials and election officials. And the whole hearing turned into a screaming match, uh, a one-sided screaming match for members of the Judiciary Committee, um, lecturing him about abusing the First Amendment rights of parents. Um, it, it's not going to be effective if it's simply political theater. Yes, indeed. And Locke, you say in your New Lines magazine piece that a church-style investigation into the uh, Trump January 6 probe and the Trump documents probe isn't warranted. Is your advice to the Justice Department to just ignore the Jim Jordan committee or try and ignore it if it's compelled to respond? Well, no, I think the Justice Department has got a couple of special prosecutors who are moving ahead, and that's the way it should be. But I also think that the Congress ought to be involved, too, in the sense of having its own inquiries. The question is, can it do it in a fair and impartial way? And I can tell you one thing, you know, the Republicans have a recent record of walking away from these investigations. When Barbara Feinstein looked into torture on the Senate Intelligence Committee, the Democrats had to end up doing it themselves. The Republicans left. Then when you look at the January 6th committee, the Republicans left that. I'm pretty sure when the Democrats, and there'll be five of them on this Jordan committee, uh, come to the table, they're going to be there and they're going to be serious. I bet they're going to be civil, but they're going to tr try to come to the, the bottom of this. And this is going to be a good demonstration by the Democrats on that subcommittee how to yeah. conduct an inquiry rather than just yelling at each other across the party divide. Well. Good luck to uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin, uh, who has to push back against the wing nuttery of Jim Jordan and co. Bob, last question to you. In the last week, we've learned that Mike Pence turned over documents from his home. The FBI turned up more documents at Biden's home. Uh, no matter how Pence's sanctimonious words may have come back to haunt him or how poorly Joe Biden has handled this, I think we can agree it's been a mess for the White House. No matter all of that, these are still different situations, legally, criminally, from the Donald Trump Mar-a-Lago situation, are they not? They are, and I think it's a distraction that they do have this commonality in terms of mishandling of classified documents. I think it is a significant matter that Joe Biden and Mike Pence have, have, have classified documents in their homes, and we need to look into that and figure out a better way to have better controls. But it is very different from the situation we have with Donald Trump, uh, where we have seen a willful retention of documents and potentially yes. obstruction of justice. Yes. Uh, it is, like many, uh, the difference between um, an accidental fender bender and driving your car intentionally into a crowd of people. They both yeah. involve cars, but very different levels of intent. Well put. Uh, we will have to leave it there on that note. Locke Johnson and Bob McQuaid, uh, a fascinating conversation. Thank you both.